Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Welcome to my video on the physics of the Fosbury flop. First, a little of historical background. It was first introduced in 1968 by Dick Fosbury from the University of Oregon. Um, it was a brand new high jumping technique. Um, it it helped to raise the world record of the high jump by nearly a foot, like 30 centimeters. And currently it's used by nearly all the world class uh, high jumpers. First, I want to thank Bill for telling me about this problem, and it's a great physics problem, so let's have a look at it. Uh, here's a chart of the world high jump record going back for, to 1895 all the way to 1980. All right, 1895, we had a world record of approximately 1.9 meters over here on the y-axis, and in 1980, um, probably close to uh, two meters and 35 centimeters, right? 2.35 meters. Um, a couple of dates are indicated here on this chart, uh, indicating kind of different techniques that were introduced. So the Western roll is a high jump technique introduced in 1912, and you can see its impact to raising that world record here by approximately 10 centimeters. Um, a new technique called the straddle came around, um, and then again, you can see the increase here by adapting this new technique and perfecting it. But have a look at this blue arrow. This is the Fosbury flop over here, 1968. And have a look at the huge gain over here in the high jump world record when uh, this technique was introduced by Dick Fosbury and then was later perfected. Uh, right now, the world record is at approximately 2 meters and 45 centimeters. Um, so it's not much higher than it was in 1980. So here's just the chart showing you this Fosbury flop technique. I have two images of jumpers here going over the high jump bar. And what you notice here is there's two things. First of all, the jumper goes over the bar face up, right? And the other thing is that they arch their back as much as possible. You can see the both jumpers over here with this huge arch. What that does is when your body creates an arch like this, it moves the center of mass actually outside of their bodies. And sometimes if you arch it enough, the center of mass can actually pass below the bar, which is quite incredible. So in the next slide, we're gonna set up a simple model of a jumper in order to analyze how far the center of mass can extend beyond the body. All right, so the goal now is to create a simple model here uh, of a high jumper. Okay, so I've got uh, the picture here on the left is just, we're gonna model a high jumper as a uniform bar. It has a certain length L and it has a mass M. Now, if that bar is straight, like on the left-hand side, that represents no arching of the body whatsoever. And for a given input, right, you try to jump as high as you can, a high jumper is able to elevate their center of mass to a certain height. So that would be the maximum height that you'd be able to jump with that given energy input. All right, now if you're able to arch your back, again, you're gonna have a certain length L, and I'm gonna assume here um, that the angle of the arch is going to be 90 degrees as shown here on the figure on the right, okay? The goal now is going to be to calculate how high is the center of mass here, and it's going to be along that Y axis because the mass is evenly distributed on both sides of this X axis. So let's go ahead and set up this integral for the position of the center of mass and then compare it to the case where there is no arching of the body. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, so we start with our model of the body here, which is just an arch. We have a radius, which we're calling R, and that radius is constant. Now my goal is to figure out what is this vector here, our center of mass, and again, by symmetry, I should know it's only gonna be along the y-axis. So the first thing we do now is we have to uh, apply our definition of center of mass, and before I do that, I'm just gonna call the vector r that goes from the origin all the way to a little bit of mass on the arch. Uh, next thing I could do is I can just denote that little element of mass as dm, some infinitesimal mass. And that's it. Now I'll also just parameterize this arch just in terms of this angle phi. And I know that the total angle of the arch is going to be 90 degrees, okay, for this uh, particular model that I'm setting up. So now you apply the definition of center of mass. Now I'm gonna write it down in vector form over here, and this is what it looks like. 
The position of the center of mass as a vector is equal to 1 over the total mass of the object. And here I have to integrate this vector r um, over all of the mass of the system. Okay, you have to add up all of these different contributions. So how do you evaluate this integral right here? Well, the first thing we're going to focus on is this vector r right here. The vector r, you can write it in terms of x and y coordinates, right? Um, you could just simply write it as x multiplied by i hat plus y multiplied by j hat. Now, clearly this problem here, um, it's probably best to solve this problem using polar coordinates right here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define x and y in terms of this angle phi here that I have defined in the figure. If you do that in polar coordinates, this is the definition, right? x is simply r cos of phi and y is r sine of phi. Now what you can do is you can now go ahead, substitute both of these definitions for x and y inside the definition for r, and then you substitute it into that big integral, and this is what you get. All right, this looks like a complicated looking expression, however, um, we're going to go on the next page and take it one step further. We have to define what the limits of the integral are, and also deal with that mass element dm. So let's go on the next page and continue the problem. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with this little mass dm right here. And that little mass, I can write it down. Basically, this arch is a one-dimensional object. So you can write the little bit of mass as being a mass density, which I call lambda, multiplied by the length of that section of arch right there. Okay. Now, how would you write this section of arch? Again, it's just a little segment of length right here. In polar coordinates, I can write that as r multiplied by some angle, okay? Uh, d phi that I'm calling. Now what you do is you simply substitute this definition of dm back into the integral here. And now this gives us our integral um, or the variable that we have to integrate over in order to find this uh, position of the center of mass. So this is all I do, I make that substitution. And um, uh, one last step over here, now you can uh, break it down, um, just distribute everything, and I wanna split it up into two integrals. We're gonna see in a minute that one of these integrals is going to be zero, and we know that, right, just by the symmetry of the problem, that the integral over cos theta d theta really should vanish when I set the limits up. So that's the next goal we have to consider, what are the limits of integration for this problem, and then we simply have to evaluate. All right, we now need to set up the limits of integration. So again, we've defined that angle theta to be 90 degrees, and the object is symmetric about that vertical axis. Um, so right away, you should be able to write that that angle, that initial angle of phi, where I start the integral, is going to be 45 degrees. You can write that as pi over 4 if you want to work in radians. That's fine. Now the final angle, well the final angle you could see from this uh, figure right here, you could define the final angle as being the initial, the 45, plus my angle theta. So just substitute my 90 degrees in there, and we get our final angle which is 135 degrees. Uh, you can also write that in radians as uh, 3 pi over 4. Alright, pretty straightforward. Let's go back to the integral now. All right, the goal now is to evaluate this integral. I've got my integration limits here for both of those. And now you simply evaluate the first integral. Uh, we got a bunch of constant terms in the front. You just leave those there. And you can write the integral of cos d phi is simply equal to sine of phi. All right, and the integral of sine of phi d phi gives me minus cos of phi. Now once you substitute the limits in there, you're going to notice that the term in the i hat direction or the x direction actually goes to zero. And when you substitute uh, the limits for the cos function, uh, because of the angles, you end up getting this positive number and you get the same term twice. All right, now you can simplify this term and you're going to be only left with a contribution in that j hat direction. So group everything together nicely and we get a final result here. Now it doesn't look too neat. We're going to go on the next page and uh, just clean this up a little bit, but that's how you evaluate this integral. All right, so we start our result here and it's written in terms of this mass density, which I've defined as lambda. It's also written in terms of the radius squared and the total mass, but the goal now is to kind of eliminate what this uh, mass density is. 
So first thing we're gonna notice here is that this arch here has a total length right here, right? Um, and the length, you can write it as uh, S for an arch length, and it's always given by the radius multiplied by that angle of the arch. In this case, it's 90 degrees. Now remember, it's important to work in radians right here. So what you can do is simply write that the total arch length S has to be R multiplied by uh, 90 degrees, or pi over two. Now the next thing you do is we write down our definition. So the definition of lambda is if the mass is uniformly distributed here, what you have is it's the definition is the total mass of that person divided by that total length of the object, which I have written here in terms of the radius and the angle. Now if you clean that up a little bit, you just bring the two on the upstairs, you're gonna get two times mass total divided by pi r. Now what you want to do is you go back and you substitute this lambda in my expression here at the top of the page. And now you notice you have total mass here which uh, appears in the numerator and the denominator. You can cancel that. You can also cancel one of the radius values. Um, and anyway, and their final result now uh, looks like this. All right, so we have a numerical factor in the front, which is determined by the geometry of the object, but it's also proportional to the radius here, right? The radius of this arch measured with respect to the ground. So that is a property of this arch right here. All right, let's go on the next page and maybe substitute some numbers. All right, so let's have a look at where we were before the Fosbury flop, right? The world record was right around here. That corresponds to a height of about 2.1 meters. Well, let's go back to our expression over here. So our expression, we have two root two multiplied by the radius over pi. Uh, if you substitute these numbers in the calculator, two root two divided by pi, you get approximately 0 0.9 times the radius, okay, of this arch that corresponds to the height of the center of mass, okay? So we just saw that a flat object, the maximum height is probably right around this 2.1 meter. Okay, so that means that the center of mass, or that athletes can raise their center of mass approximately 2.1 meters. But what would be the radius here? You notice that the radius is bigger than this 2.1 meters. Uh, the radius, all you have to do is bring that 0 0.9 on the other side, so you get my 2.1 meters for the height of the center of mass, divided by approximately 0 0.9. I'm going to put that in the calculator, 2.1 divided by 0 0.9, and I get 2.33 oh, meters. Well, that's incredible, right? And let's go back to the chart. Look at that. That height here corresponding to the Fosbury flop, you know, it was a little bit uh, less than that, but still, right? You have a pretty good approximation for kind of this increase just using this simple mathematical model for an arch. All right, folks, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed this video. Actually, I learned quite a bit about uh, just high jumping and center of mass problems uh, just by studying this problem. So it was a good one. We'll see you next time.